Hello there, I'm Black Bright and I'm giving you a legislation evening this evening because um, it's the 6th of April. Um, 6th of April we get a lot of new legislation coming in. So I've just done the legislation on the emergency coronavirus bill because it had some elements in there that a lot of people won't know about but which are important because it will affect you especially if you have somebody who dies and you need to know what is going on, what the new laws are, and also what the, the powers that the police have now. So I've done that separately. Now, this is a less tenuous um, legislation, albeit, you know, in this particular time and this particular climate, any kind of legislation, new legislation, a new financial cost to us, is just going to add to our the way we're feeling. So, but forearmed, forewarned is forearmed. And so, hopefully, if I let you know beforehand, if if something is new to you, at least you're prepared and are aware. So that's what I like to do. I like to think that I am forewarning and forearming, so you don't get a shock and think, "Oh bloody hell! I wish I'd known that." then I would have done this differently or I wouldn't have done that and so forth and so on. Okay, so some of the new laws and financial changes in 2020. Well, we all know about the rail fares. They went up by 2.7% in January, but we're not taking the train now, the majority of us anyway. So it won't apply. So they can keep their 2.7%. And they're going to lose a lot more. I hope they don't just, because of that, stick it up again. But yeah, 2.7%. When you're thinking about um, people who have season tickets, it means a 1,500 season ticket will rise by £40.50. While London to Guildford annual ticket will tip, which typically cost £3,702, will rise by 104 to 3,836. I mean, when you think about 2.7% on a £10 ticket, it doesn't seem much. But when you kind of, the ticket, the season tickets get more and more expensive, it is a dent in your pocket. March 20, you have the right to request decent, affordable broadband. I thought it was the obligation of the broadband provider to give you a decent service. Maybe it wasn't. Hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses have the choice of slow broadband, hideously expensive broadband, or no broadband. That's set to end for many with a new right called the Universal Service Obligation. From March the 20th, which was a couple of weeks ago, Anyone can request a connection that can deliver 10 megabits per second. And a 1 megabit per second upload speed and cost for less than £45 a month. 45 quid a month, that's still a lot of money. Especially if you don't really watch it all that much. Bloody cheap, £45. They should be making it cheaper and cheaper. I mean, they're just gearing this up, really, so that we're all up and ready for whatever new systems they have in place. That's what all this is about. But if that's the case, if they want to lure people in, make it 30 quid a month, 45 quid a month. Who can afford that? The regular John Joe. I think it's much too much. Maybe it's not. Sometimes, you know, my daughter says she pays £60 for all, her, for all of her, um, what you call it, all the programmes and she has everything on hers. Me, I have the bare minimum. I'm not a TV watcher, really. You know, I have my little programmes occasionally, like Love Island, that's finished, so I don't watch that. What do I watch? Gogglebox. But I'm hardly on the TV. I hardly watch TV. And if I do, I look for something that's light and entertainment that takes me away from all the humdrum of life. So me paying 45 quid, it's not worth it for me. So it might be worth it for some of you. And if you've got two people pitching in 20 quid each, then maybe. But 45 quid, I think that's a lot of money. And if you don't have the internet of this quality, you have the legal right to request it. 
as long as the installation would cost them cost less than three thousand four hundred. Where they get three thousand four hundred from? Normally, it only costs the, you about thirty quid to install it, doesn't it? About fifty quid. I must be missing something here. Well, unless they're talking about people in remote areas who don't have no broadband at all. I don't know where they've got 3,400 from. Anyway, if it costs more, you can still have broadband installed, but may have to pay the excess cost. Maybe it's for people who've never had broadband. But even then, I can't imagine it costing nearly 3,400. Anyway, what do I know? April the 1st, a um, couple of days ago, councils can double council tax for empty homes. Then that might affect some of you. How many of you have got an empty home that's just out there doing nothing? So what they're saying, they're going to double your council tax. Or the alternative is you don't make it empty. There, There's a call from Copeland Council is asking landlords to make their... These people are dread, you know. Asking people to make their empty homes available to all the homeless people and um, or people who have been kicked out of their properties. I mean, in all fairness, I mean, it is nice to have an extra home. But I've seen these um, programs, Nightmare, Slum Landlords. Yeah, I do like that. Oh, and I do love Judge, um, Judge Judy. So, yeah, I guess I do watch them Border Force and... Stuff like that. I like watching stuff like that occasionally, but I do love to watch that. But yeah, you see in this slum landlords and nightmare tenants where they go into your place and they mess up and graffiti the walls and all the places dirty and, you know, the chairs are damaged. I mean, it's fine asking landlords to put up tenants, but you would think that Unless there's another reason for landlords getting rid of tenants, it's usually because they're not good payers or, like in this situation, it's because of the coronavirus, which is not their fault. And the landlords should take into consideration, were they good payers before this happened? Now, are, is Copeland Council asking landlords to take on... Um, um, what do you want to say? Reliable tenants who've got a, a good history of keeping the place clean and who realise that it's a temporary arrangement. I mean, all of that would have to be probably drawn up in some kind of contract. Otherwise, you're giving somebody your house and then you can't get rid of them when you want to. And it's hard enough to get rid of somebody anyway because they're making it two to three months before you can get rid of them. It's almost like the government is punishing property owners who've got more than one property. That's what it's like because the buy to lets are being penalised and so now are people with empty properties. If you've got two properties and you've got one empty, surely if you've paid your mortgage on it, it's up to you what you do with it. Why should you be penalised and have to pay double council tax? Why? So do they begrudge you having an empty property? I remember reading um, a property, uh, reading this article. It was a man and his wife. They had a property mortgage free for 1.2 million. Can you imagine having a mortgage free property for 1.2 million? Well, they had a mortgage free property for 1.2 million and they had a barn. And they wanted to put in a £50,000 bathroom en suite. I would not want to imagine what a bathroom, en suite bathroom looks like for 50 grand. But that's what they wanted. So they wanted a loan, a mortgage. Um, or was it a loan? It's either a loan or a mortgage for the 50000 But they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it for love or money. Um, the man was retired. The woman was working, the wife was working on 40000 a year. And what they was advised to do was, because they didn't have a mortgage on the 1.2 million property, and the barn was like an extension of that property, what they was told to do was set, divide the properties 
and then divide the barn and have a separate title for the barn and then a separate title for the main building. And then because that barn wouldn't have a mortgage on it, they would then find it easier to get the 50 grand. So, um, of course, they'd need a mortgage broker and all that mortgage, yeah, mortgage broker to take them so they do it properly. But that's what they were advising. But what I'm saying is, is that it's like even the rich um, have a tough time or even more of a tough time. And apparently it's got something to do with how it's supposed to be paid over a period of time. Like normally when they give you a mortgage, they'll give it, it's three, it's three and a half times your salary. So they only wanted 50,000. The wife's salary was 40,000. So it wouldn't be cost effective for them to loan them 50,000 when she's earning 40,000. She, if the loan was for three and a half times, three, fours of 12, the loan was for Hundred and twenty. So if the loan was for hundred and twenty, hundred and fifty thousand, they would have got it. But fifty thousand was too small. Anyway, sorry for that digression. But yeah, we were talking about properties, and if you've got an extra property, you're going to have to pay um, bills increasing by fifty percent if they leave properties vacant for more than two years. Well, at least you've got two years to get someone in there or to do something about it. Okay. From April, from April, that figure increased to 100%. Hold on, let me go back a bit. Property owners can already face council tax bills increasing by 50% if they leave properties vacant for more than two years. And from April, that figure increases to 100%, potentially doubling the charge for homes left empty for long periods of time. Almost 13,000 houses are empty for 10 years. Why would you have an empty house for 10 years? 13,000. But I understood that it's these rich people that are coming over, you know, these people on the golden visa. They're coming over, buying properties. They're not living in them. It's like they're supposed to be investment properties. And then they go back to wherever. So it can only be these rich people who have bought all these houses in the UK and, you know, you've got, and the, the government can't do nothing about it because sometimes they can't even track the people down. And I guess most of those properties are mortgage free. So those people can do whatever they like. But if that is the case, how are they going to get them to pay the council tax? Well, I guess there's ways and means of doing that. That's not really our business, is it? But anyway, almost 13,000 houses are empty for 10 years as 127,000 children face homelessness in 2020. So as if these 13,000 houses are going to take on these 120 homeless kids. I mean, are they really? I mean, it would be nice because they're not living in them anyway. And they could have it some, like some charity. I'm sure there'd be some tax offset against it. So in principle, it would be nice, but I'd imagine that those homes are quite lavish. And also on April the 1st, hospital parking charged axed for some. Hospital, park, hospital parking charges for thousands of NHS patients and staff will be scrapped in England from April 2020. And I think it's from the 6th of April. Could be the 1st. Blue badge holders, frequent outpatients and parents of sick kids are among the groups. I remember talking about this ages ago. This isn't really new news. Um, that will benefit from the Tory pledge, which comes after a long mirror campaign. But not all NHS staff and patients will get free parking. Oh, no. And they would have done under Labour's plans, but the Health Secretary, Health Secretary Matt Hancock, said it would prior, prioritise those with the greatest need, adding... One of the concerns mentioned regularly on the doorsteps was that vulnerable people and staff working nights have to pay for hospital car parking. That shouldn't be right. But why would they have to pay hospital par par car parking? I'm, I'm getting all tongue-tied. 
Why would they have to pay for hospital car parking when it's free after six? I don't get that. Not unless I have to walk a little distance. Because some hospitals, you know, they are quite remote. Okay, April the 1st, minimum wage rise. We currently expecting a new rate of £8.67 for those aged 25 and over, up from £8.21 an hour now, but the exact figure cannot be confirmed yet. New hourly rates for the following April are announced in the budget, which are only expecting in February due to delays around the election. This must be quite old. But the funny thing is, is that what's the point now at the moment? That's not going to take effect until a few months time, is it? April the 6th, changes to rights of agency and gig economy workers. Currently, when people who earn varying amounts of money from week to week, particularly those on flexible contracts, take a paid holiday. The employer has to pay them holiday pay, which equates to the average weekly wage they earned over the 12 weeks before that holiday. From the 6th of April 2020, that is changing. Employers will have to calculate the average weekly wage from an entire year, 52 weeks rather than just 12 weeks. Boy, they're really trying to turn off employers, aren't they? I mean, do they really want people to have a job? They're making it so expensive for employers to employ people. The reform is intended to improve the holiday pay for seasonal workers who, in, who tend to lose out over the way it's currently calculated. But if you're seasonal workers, I mean, seasonal workers were supposed to, they weren't supposed to be on the minimum wage. The whole point of agency staff and seasonal workers was that they got more than everybody else to compensate for holiday, sickness and whatever else. And I remember um, a lady, she was, she came in as a locum, as a locum specialist. I think she was getting £500 a week, five or £600 a week. Yeah, I think she was getting about five or six hundred pounds. It could have been more, actually. But I know it was about five thousand a month. It worked out to be about five thousand a month. But my point is, is that she gets that as an agency because number one, the work isn't guaranteed. Number two, she has to pay her sick pay, her tax and insurance, and her holiday pay out of that. So I don't understand why seasonal workers should be number one getting the minimum pay. And number two, the employers are now being asked to compensate. They'd probably be better off just giving them a bit more a week and telling them, look, I'm not going to give you all that holiday, but I'll give you an extra amount, an hour or whatever. They'd probably be better off doing that. So, written statement. Employers will also be required to provide a statement of particulars of day one of employment, which include, on day one of employment, which must include hours and days of the week the worker employee is required to work, whether they, have, whether they may be varied and how entitlements to paid leave, details of any probationary, probationary period, Details of training provided by the employer. I reckon that this is in collaboration with DWP. And I reckon that this is to take some of the onus off of DWP. I wonder where it goes to, the statement. I wonder if it goes to DWP. I guess really and truly, it's just like a letter of employment. I guess it does secure, this is good because it does secure the employee. I think it's like uh, some kind of contract. So whereas normally seasonal employees, they just go in and there's no, but it defeats the object of zero contracts, gig contracts. It defeats the object. Because the whole point of having these zero contracts was 
the employer would employ these people as and when they need them. There was no responsibility, no onus on the employer. They just had somebody come in, do the work, and then on your bike. They pay them and on your bike. That's not the case now. It looks like they're trying to um, get them to do some kind of contract now, which is going to put off a lot of employers. It's too much commitment. And so neither benefits because the employee doesn't benefit because he's out of a job or she's out of a job. And the employer doesn't benefit. Well, they'll always get somebody, but whoever they get, I guess they're probably, it's more work for the people already there. I don't know. Parental bereavement leave. Way back in 2017, the government backed a private member's bill which proposed giving workers the right to unpaid leave up for up to two weeks as a right from one, as a right from day one of their employment should they suffer the tragedy of their child dying under the age of 18. Oh, I didn't know that. Unpaid leave of up to two weeks. For two weeks, it's not much, is it? The child dies. Two weeks, I probably need bloody eternity, mate. Anyway, this became law in September 2018 and is expected to come into force in early 2020. While most employers do give discretionary, compassionate leave in such tragic circumstances, some do not. How can they not? Well, I guess they'll say, take your annual leave. Or you can get two or three days compassionate leave. This law, which also applies to women who suffer a stillbirth or a miscarriage, from the 24th week of pregnancy changes that. Because that can be quite traumatic as well. April the 6th. Okay, so that's that. April the 6th, national insurance is cut by up to £85 a year. The Tories pledged to raise national insurance threshold in their manifest, in their manifesto. manifesto. From April, you will pay no national insurance contributions on the first 9,500 of your earnings, up from 8,632 at the moment, working out to a saving of about £85 a year. They make it look like it's such a whole heap of money. £85 a year, how much is that? It's about about £7 a week or something. Anyway, the move has been criticised for falling short of the 500 a year Boris Johnson promised. I wonder how he's doing. Heard today that he went into um, critical care, but he doesn't need a ventilator. He's breathing okay, so. And only helping better earners who are already over the threshold. For others, it's not quite the all-out win you might think with the move meaning some of the worst off might now miss out on some of their state pension as a result. Where am I going, Fari? Stephen Cameron, pensions director at Aegon, said, under the current rules, they are not paying any national insurance. Sorry. Under current rules, those not paying any national insurance lose out on credits due towards their state pension. Yeah, I would think so. Oh, I see. So by reducing it, that's going to reduce the amount you're entitled to when it comes to your state pension. That's what they're saying. Individuals need 35 years of qualifying national insurance contributions to receive the full state pension with those with fewer qualifying years, seeing a reduction and receive none if they have fewer than 10 years of credit. April the 6th, another subject, another legislation, Tories will let families inherit 1 million tax-free, finishing what Osborne started. You see all them Theodore? Families can inherit one million tax free. They used to have this thing called the nil rate, um, the nil rate band. 
So over a certain amount, I think it was 375 at the time, 375,000 per, per couple. Three thousand. No, I think each couple, they were allowed to have 375,000. It's a long time ago, so don't quote me. But they would do a nil rate band will to offset that. And they'd put one of them into trust and then they wouldn't have to worry about this. But this is going to do a lot of solicitors out because if they can inherit one, one pound million tax free, they won't need any of it. And from what I see, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Who knows? Families will be able to pass one mi No, they won't need an ill rate band will, unless it's, unless it's more than a million. Families will be able to pass a one million of their wealth without inheritance tax when they die. Wow. But that is good if you won the lottery because you would normally have to pay quite a bit. So that is good. But I mean, it's the rich looking after the rich, isn't it, really? Tell your boy, when you have money. Okay, currently some of the huge, oh, there it is. I was right. And I didn't even read it. I was just basing it on my memory because I used to work in private client in a firm of solicitors. So I would do the nil rate band wills. So that's why I knew, but that was what? Maybe about 2009. So it's quite a while ago. That's when I did it. So I remembered well, and it hasn't changed. So anyway, currently someone who dies can leave 325000 of their estate tax-free. But Tory George Osborne added an extra tax-free amount that applies only to property. In April, this extra portion rises from 150000 to 175,000, meaning if someone owns a home, they can leave 500,000 tax free, and this doubles if the couple is married. Because what they was what they used to say at the time is that, especially houses in London, that million could be, you know, swapped up, you know, swallowed up in no time. So this kind of takes it into account. OK, people paying back student loans get a mirror tax, a minor tax break in April. Recent graduates will be able to earn £26,575 a year before payments kick in up from 25,725 a year. They always make it look like it's a whole heap of money people like it. Don't they though? 26,000 up from 25,700. So it's about 1,200. 1,200 that's just under that's just over 40 pound a week. That should save them 76 pound 50 in payments per year. I guess £76.50 is £76.50. Better than a kick in the teeth, isn't it? People who graduated between 1998 and 2011 will see their threshold rise too, from 18935 a year to 19390 April the 8th. What's today's date? That's tomorrow. State pension will rise by 3.9%. In line, same amount as the increase as the um, council tax. Give with one hand, take with the other. The state pension will rise by 3.9% from April, more than double the rate of inflation. Such an increase means pensioners can expect a rise of just over £6 a week on the new state pension from the current rate of £168.80. Well, £6 a week. What can we buy for £6 a week? Well, you could buy a whole chicken. You can buy a dozen eggs and some bacon. You can buy six lottery picks. 
I mean, you can't sniff at any little increase, to be honest. I mean, sometimes I might sound a bit facetious, but, you know, it, every little helps. Every little helps. So we're grateful for that. Okay, but hundreds of thousands of over 75s will see around half of their pension wiped out by the cost of paying for their own TV license after the benefit was scrapped. What did I say? Out with one hand, in with the other. So now they'll have to pay. So they get £6 extra a week. No, it's still, it's still okay though. £6 extra a week. £24 a month. And the TV licence is £11 a month. Or roughly, I think. So they still get a little bit, but not as much as they might have liked. So Tory ministers pledged to protect the state pension with a triple lock. That means it rises by inflation, 2.5% or average earnings, whichever is the highest. Average weekly earnings rose by 3.9% in the year to May to July 2019. I hope that made sense. Let me read it again, because sometimes, for some reason, I probably think I've probably been talking too long. I seem to be muffling and swallowing my words and stuff like that. So I'm just going to read the last paragraph. Tory, Tory ministers pledged to protect the state pension with a triple lock. That means it rises by inflation 2.5% or average earnings, whichever is the highest. Average weekly earnings rose by 3.9% in the year to May to July 2019. I hope that was clear. Okay, we're not, we're getting there, we're getting there. Do you want to put me on pause? Go and get yourself a nice cuppa, a nice glass of Merlot, or maybe you like Chardonnay. Anyway, maybe you need a little break. Not too far to go. April the 8th, benefit freeze ends. After almost a decade of freezes and caps, about 2.5 million people on universal credit and millions more on legacy benefits will get a 1.7% increase in April. The increase means someone on £500 a month in benefits will get an extra £8.50. But it is less than the rise in average earnings and less than the rise in pensions. But there again, I know, keep my mouth shut, this isn't the time. Yeah. Council tax to rise. Local authorities will get the power to raise council tax by up to 4% from April. 2% for general spending and 2% for social care. What did I tell you? You get six credit extra in one way, they take it with the next. So you don't really get anything. What you do is you get something just to pay someone, just to pay it back. Which I guess is better than having to pay it out of what you had before. I'm just trying to be rational here. Okay, that's worth an extra 70 quid to on the average band D council tax home in England. Council by council rises with only to be confirmed in February and March, June the 1st, the end of the free TV licenses for over 75. So that means my mum's going to have to fork out extra money. I wonder if it would be reduced. TV licenses are free for over 75, but from June the 1st, you'll only get one if you're receiving pension credit. Funny thing is, you know what? Back in the day, over 75, they could already see the TV. They're like, oh, hey. they were actually, they were probably dead. Oh, honestly, over 75s back in the day, 1940s, 50s, they were probably dead. So when they were nearly dying, they, they thought, oh, well, they're not watching no TV. So, you know, we'll make it free for the over 75s. So you'd see all these little ladies all shaking and say, oh, we're watching Ina Sharples on Coronation Street. But now, over 75s, they're bloody up and, you know, up and getting and going and doing all sorts. Going to the bloody gym. So they're like, mm -mm. no, you're too fit. You can afford to pay to watch TV. So that's what's happened. 
they've extended it. So the over 75s aren't the old over 75s. I think you probably have to be over 95 probably at this rate to get free TV. But then again, it's saying over 75. So that's from over 75, period. Regardless, even if you're 120. I wonder if um, people who are blind get free TV licenses. Because, they, you know, because they probably could hear. That'd be an interesting one. Hmm. Anyway, around 3 million households are set to be affected. BBC chairman David Clementi said, copying the current scheme was ultimately untenable. But the Tories were slammed for breaking their promise to protect the benefit by handing over responsibility for it to the BBC. July or later, millions will start being moved over, moving over. Sure. July or July or later, millions will start being moved over, moved onto universal credit. It's amazing. When you read something, you actually read what you think is there and what is not exactly there. That's what I'm doing. Because I'm thinking about move over and it's saying move on to. So forgive me for my lax for days ago. I've had a long day at work, a really stressful day at work. You know, I commandeered that office and I was quite happy by myself, isolated. Two people coming to the office to work today, into the office that I am in. I was vexed. I'm sitting there thinking, you're not six feet away. You're not six feet away. You're too bloody close for my liking. I went out, found one little, oh, one little room. There was a man in there. And I said, do you mind if I use one of the computers at the end? He said, no, that's fine. So I went up to the other end and I set up the computer, put all the folders, made all, you know, got all my local drives and downloaded them and stuff like that. To download everything ready to work, some woman comes in. Oh, are you such and such? And oh, can you show me this? And the two of them start bloody doing all of that. And I'm just like, oh. Then I thought, okay, let me go back to my original desk, which is in an open plan. And because there's not much people there, let me go and sit on that seat. Then all I could hear is about somebody talking about that person dying. That person's got coronavirus. Then they started talking about Boris. And then, ah, oh, it was incessant. I thought to myself, you know what? I just need to get out of this place. I was so stressed today. And as I was going, um, I said goodbye to my boss. And I said to her, are you coming in tomorrow? She goes, no. I said, good. And she smiled. I thought to myself, if you're coming in tomorrow, I'm having a day's leave. Because, you know, too cl close is too close. You know what I mean? And like I said, you don't know if people have got this um, and symptomatic, you know, where they're not showing any symptoms and they have it. And people seem to think if they ain't got it, or if they're not coughing or whatever, they're okay. But not necessarily. Anyway, that's me with my little state of paranoia going totally off the subject. So let's get back. So July or later, millions will start being moved onto universal credit. The limited pilot scheme. I thought they were putting that on hold. Anyway, the limited pilot scheme for migrating existing benefit claims onto universal credit is set to finish by July. I've got a funny feeling that this is old news because I'm, I swear I saw somewhere where they said that because of the coronavirus, they were suspending it. So I'm not even reading that. I've got a funny feeling that is the state. I'm sure this is, I didn't even check the date, but that bit is definitely, I'm sure that's been superseded. October the 5th, the state pension age will finish rising to 66. From October, you'll need to be at least 66 to get a state pension, whatever your gender. The age people can at has been rising for years, starting with increasing women's state pension age until it matched men, then increasing both from 65 to 66. You see, they're saying it's because women used to say, oh, we're equal, we're equal. And then for some reason, because women were saying we're equal, we like men, we want the same pay as men, even though they're not getting it. They said, oh, so it gone on. Well, if that is the case, you can get your pension the same time as men. So they fell right in it. 
and waspy and whatever, there's nothing they can do. All this screaming that they've been doing, mm -mm. it's fallen on dead ears. AJ Bell analyst Tom Selby said the rise started incrementally in 2018 and is scheduled to complete by October 2020. That means anyone born after the 5th of October 1954 will have a state pension age of at least 66. It's not the last time it will rise, though. The Conservatives have set pl out plans to increase the state, the state pension age again to 67 by 2028. Well, that's quite a long way away, though. And 68 by 2039. It's the way this coronavirus is going. We won't even be alive anyway, so... I wouldn't worry too much about it. But I do hope you found it all useful. Bye-bye.